How many of you have heard of ggplot? ggplot is all, right? ggplot2? Well, ggplot is the Python version of the all ggplot. And as it says in the description, it's not very powerful. If you want like a one-off pretty thing that you can just hand into someone, it's great. If you need any level of customization, you're probably going to end up hitting yourself in the foot. But the good thing about ggplot is it's really, really simple. And what I mean by that is it's one line of code to get something like this. And we like one lines of code to get complicated figures, right? It's also one of those that the reason it does it with Python is so that it'll talk to the pandas data frame directly. And the pandas data frame works exactly like the old, like the R data frame, which is what it's modeled on. And so yeah, if you need a basic static plot and you, don't, and you just want it pretty, ggplot, maybe. Now what if you need 3D, right? You're working high dimensional, you need 3D. You have two options here. First option is Maya V. And Maya V is kind of long in the tooth now. It's been around forever. It's put out by Anthrod. And it's really a whole GUI UI system. And what we mean by that is like Maya V is kind of designed to work within the GUI. You know, you pull it here, you do a scene there, you do um, lighting, shading, rendering, whatever, <laughs> click buttons. But it does have a scriptal language. And the scriptal language is easy and straightforward. And again, the whole looks like MATLAB, matplotlib, looks like MATLAB, one line, and you can get a nice complicated figure. But it's questionably fast. If you want fast, well, there's VisPy, which talks to OpenGL. The problem with VisPy, and VisPy is fast, it's powerful, it's great. Little problem, though. You still need to know OpenGL to use it, which means on a practical level, you need to write raw C to do it. So if the idea of writing raw C scares you, Maya V is what you're kind of your only option for doing 3D plots. Otherwise, this V is pretty good, but as you can see, just to do a simple figure, it's a lot of boilerplate. You need to set up your OpenGL render shade stuff. You need to send up your canvas, you need to initialize the canvas, you need to talk about your drawing element, your interactive element. So you're doing, again, your multiple kind of layers of code here for something simple. But if you need to do 3D and a lot of 3D, like really big, these are your only options. Everything else is kind of going to crash and burn at around the 10,000 to 10 million data points set. Um, OK. So, but, so these are your 3D. Next, we'll talk about interaction, right? Because a lot of you have to do interaction. Again, the old standard is Chaco. Chaco is for desktop interactions. Like if you're on the off hand, you're on a system, there is no JavaScript, there are no browsers, you can't do your interactions that way. You need to do it on the desktop. Chaco is your only option. Again, it's, look the thing about Chaco, Maya V, and a couple of others we'll talk about is that it's supported by Nthought, so you have a nice big corporate you know, ecosystem around it, which means it's probably not going to go away. It means you have people who will answer your support questions. Kind of, if you're thinking in a corporate environment, it's a good family to use. And so Chaco, right, great if we need to do interactive, if we need to do, what it's really great for are these like linked plots, like here, like this plot is linked to that plot is linked to that plot, or that rushing stuff. But the problem with Chaco is, again, it's painful. A lot of boilerplate code to do anything. Um, this is actually really the start of the boilerplate. You'll have you know, the stuff to set up just the plot. And then what you'll have in a lot of Chaco and you don't have here is you'll have a whole separate class of stuff to set up the traits. And Chaco uses this thought, this underpinned library called traits. And that's how it handles the actual interaction. So you'll, tell, you'll set up all your different plots. And then you'll set up a traits class to say how one thing, how one um, plot talks to the other plot. Um, so if you're allowed to use the browser, though, next you can go with Bokeh. And Bokeh is kind of a spiritual successor to Chaco. It's kind of modeled on the of, like, let's use the same architecture. And so they kind of took a lot of the same ideas. But they also took this whole, they're going to write a JavaScript library. It's called Bokeh.js. Bokeh is going to talk to Bokeh.js. So all your actual visualization and your rendering, that's on the JavaScript level. And so. Get, it, what ends up happening is because it lets JavaScript handle a lot of the interaction, you get rid of a lot of the boilerplate and a lot of the cruft. Instead, you can just do a simple, let's get, set up the scatter, let's say what type of figure we have here, and we're going to go run it 
we get a picture. If we want interactive stuff with multiple plots, it's a little bit more, but again, pretty clean and straightforward. Okay, right, but we have JavaScript, right? So now you're thinking, why not just use D3? Well, we have options for that too. First option is D3Pi. But D3Pi says straight up, we're not supported anymore, go use Vincent. So, let's start, and D3Pi was just a thin wrapper around D3. So, so is Vincent, kind of. Vincent makes beautiful pictures, right? It's all JavaScript, it's all Z3. What Vincent actually does is it talks to Vega, which talks to D3 in this kind of grammar. So it takes your code, it generates this grammar that can pull down into the Vega system, talk to that. So you're kind of getting these three layers of talking here. But on the flip, again, you just say which lines you want, and it does, all, it does kind of all that underlying boilerplate magic for you. And so you can get, again, the beautiful interactive plots. Now, that's Vincent. And so now let's get to kind of write a big old standby Maplotlib, which you said all of you use, right? Maplotlib in and of itself, it says that it really wants to be simple. Has any, raise your hand if you found Maplotlib to be simple. <laughs> You know, yeah, so but here's the thing, right? Maplotlib was originally signed by scientists for scientists. And because it was signed by scientists for scientists, this is why Maplotlib has the like three ways to do everything. Well, the hundred ways to do everything, but they kind of fall down into three. The first way to do everything is the PyLab um, interface. And the PyLab interface is probably the one you guys are most familiar with from the tutorials and like your head first into Maplotlib. And that's the one that's like set up a figure, throw some stuff on it. It's what's called a stateful object where you start with the state, you draw on top of it, you draw more on top. And so this is directly from MATLAB. MATLAB wanted to do this, so that's why they do it this way. Now, this probably makes computer scientists cry. So what they also provide is the API. And so the API is object oriented. And what this means is that instead of having to worry about which function call did I make first, you know, to how do I layer stuff on top of my object, I can instead just work with a figure object, add elements to it, call it a day. There's also, like, if I need to do more than that, right? Say I need to make interactive plots. By the way, never make interactive plots in Maplotlib. If you've ever gone to Stack Overflow and seen the stuff for interactive plots in Maplotlib, you've probably seen 100 lines of code, right? Talking to the canvas and callbacks and mess. Yes? Use Chaco. Like, as much as I not fond of Chaco, it actually does simplify this a lot because it was made for interaction in Maplotlib. It was kind of clutched on by scientists that didn't want to install more stuff. So you write, but if you need to do this, you use the canvas backend API. And the idea here is you define your canvas, you write to it, you print to it. Or if you need to return Maplotlib objects like in a web, um, in a web application, you'd also use the canvas backend and write to an HTML response. So this is kind of that API when it actually matters how you're generating the figure and what you're drawing it on. So that's kind of your state right map out lib. We've seen a lot of these kind of sciencey figures because this is what again it's for. Science figures, reports, publications, you know, basics. Of course, now what are we seeing map out lib for use for a lot, right? Stats. How many of you are kind of in the data science, data analyst, financial analyst, whatever buckets? Yeah. So there's a way, again, this is one of those you could have used ggplot, or there's a really nice maplotlib wrapper to do it. And this was kind of the idea with maplotlib is that you can write stuff on top of it. So there's Seaborn. And Seaborn, right, you see these, they look like ggplot style, very pretty. And again, because it's made on top of maplotlib, it's just kind of the functions you're used to in maplotlib, the function calls or the argument list works the same. And this time you just, again, call the function, pass the fin. Because it's maplotlib style, you can also pass in an axis. You want to draw on your axis and want more control about where it is in the space. You know, like I can do this inside a grid spec by passing in an axis argument. So that full control. The other thing we see with maplotlib a lot, right, is plotting. How many of you have tried to do cartography stuff in maplotlib? How many of you want to shoot yourself in the head when you try to do it? Yeah. Right, so you're probably familiar with this one, right? Base map. 
was made by cartographers, for, by geographers and meteorologists and earth scientists for geographers and earth scientists and the whole deal. And so it's kind of messy. The way you do it is you use your, you create this base map object. You put all the information about your figure into that object, and then you simultaneously work on the base map object and on your access object, and you kind of hope it all works. There is another option, and the other option, and by the way, this has improved, right? Now you can at least pass in the access to the base map object and it'll in theory register. So the other option is Cardopi. Cardopi was developed by meteorologists at the UK Met Office, and their whole philosophy was this kind of separate object stuff is painful, so let's not do it. Instead, let's do, we're going to use a regular axis and we're going to just modify, we're going to basically subclass the map.lib axis object and we're going to just add the pieces we need to it. So instead of trying to keep track of did I add stuff on my m axis or on my, on my map.lib object or on my regular axis, I can just work directly on the axis. And again, because this is kind of UK met office, it's pretty well developed and robust. Okay, right, remember I said we don't use map.lib for interaction? I kind of sort of lied. You can use map.lib for interaction. The way you should do it though is, anyone have a guess? JavaScript, D3. And there are two ways to do this. MPL D3, it's literally a map.lib wrapper on top of D3. The way it works is, like, we've seen this a lot in the IPython notebook and IPython kind of tutorials, and they use all this all the time. And so, again, the thing I like about this is you write a lot of map.lib code, you call a plugin, you call a plugin, and you're done. Like, there's no magical cluff set up tear down, it's just set up at the bottom. It'll go through all the hard stuff underneath. If you don't like this way to do it, there's another way to do it, and that's Plotly. Plotly is a com for profit company that has an open source library, and their library is this idea, like, right, publish one line to the web. Again, it's using JavaScript underneath, and it's that you sign in, you write your map.lib code, you make a URL at the bottom, it'll publish your nice interactive graph to their website. So, that's clean. And so, I'm biased with map.lib. I will tend to recommend it to everyone. When I was thinking about this talk, I realized I was like, I'm going to write this talk and I'm going to just say, use map.lib. Unless you have a really good reason not, reason not to, use map.lib. I still actually hold by that. And the reason is because it has the largest community by far, it has the most development by far, um, the most support by far. And when you, the documentation, as long as you ignore the gallery and just look at the API, it's really good. Um, but it's also extendable, and right? That's how we see C1 base map, call to pi, whatever. Like you just build on top of that ecosystem. It's going in variable publication quality, whatever. But the truth is, right? If you actually need this brushing and linking stuff for your graphs, Chaco is easier for your working desktop. If you have access to a JavaScript browser, Boca is more straightforward and prettier. If you need the 3D, don't try to do it in map.lib, it will hate you. And nothing rotates well, so you can't see anything anyways. Um, you know, that whole thing. Okay. So, acknowledgements. Most of the, pretty much everything came from the actual piece of documentation. So, thank you people for writing good documentation. Sometimes. Okay. Questions? Yeah. So, between the deep block and seaborn? Yeah. Use 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 Seaborn. The reason I say use Seaborn because Seaborn is built on top of map.lib, which means if you want to actually go and customize stuff, it's going to be easier to do it in Seaborn because you have access to the lying map.lib object. So if you may, you're using one or the other, you may as well. Well, I think it's a good, yeah. Well, I guess if you are into data, you want to switch to R or something, then Seaborn is easier. That's what's popular. Yeah. No, I hear that, but in a general sense, if you have to pick one, Seaborn makes more sense within the ecosystem model. Yeah? Well, I just don't know, 5GT plot is also is not that Oh, it's on top of? Oh, so you can pass in an access? Okay, so then. Yeah. Uh, I want to create an animation yeah. that you can play. 
Yeah. Uh, and then I want to be, to be able to control the play, like, you know, play, you know, pause, rewind, play slow, yeah. play fast, play from here to there. So just for animation, which one would I use? Um, it depends. Mapple Lib will actually do it. Yeah. Um, not badly, because you can just make a little FFmpeg in it. And so if you make your FFmpeg in Mapple Lib, yeah. it'll just, or an MP4. Play control over that where you can, uh, yeah, so what I'm saying is a map will, will generate an MP4 for you. If it's an MP4, it just... It's just a yeah. MP4. And now I also want to add some interactivity so that you can interact with the animation and change some parameters while you're playing. That point, I would... That point, Chaco. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any equivalent between... Uh, I don't think so. Like, I don't know the R ecosystem well enough to know the. But there's nothing you know of. Yeah, the closest, like he was saying, is using Seaborn is kind of doing the same stuff as ggplot, but not really. Plotly, I think, does ggplot. Yeah. But that's also, because Plotly as a website supports multiple languages. Like, they also have a MATLAB interface, an R interface, a couple of languages. You also might conceivably not want to just put every figure you ever create with all of the data needed to create it on some uh, company server. Yeah, that's yeah, the that's problem with it. Yeah. Well, so that's, I mean, that's why, like, yes, if you have privacy concerns, Bokeh or MPLD3, depending on what you need. It's, I like it in the, like, if you want to quick something like on a blog post type thing, it's useful. Another option to do interactive plots yeah. is using the Python widgets. Where Those are MPLD3. Those, or, yeah. yeah, no, the widgets are MPLD3. Yeah. And you yeah. said the 3D is, uh, uh, which one would be for 3D, like if I want to create a model and can... How's your C? What? How's your C? How's your C? How do I see? No, how's your C? <laughs> C and C++? Yeah. 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 yeah, if you can, like if you know OpenGL, use Vis VisPy. If you don't know OpenGL, Maya V is your kind of only option. Yeah. Can you comment on the, like, why this, like, plot function that does everything API has sort of been a standard. Is this just going from MATLAB and like for example, plot and matplotlib takes like you x x zero, y zero, x one, or it takes like two lists of arrays, or and then like a bazillion options. And people seem to like this. And then when you show them something that's like just called line and it just draws a line, that's all it does. You know, it's like I, uh, I'm just wondering, so yeah, they're coming, I think, out of the yeah. I think they're coming out of like the data community where you don't want to like you don't want to call separate things every time you do something. Um, I actually don't understand that because like when I do multiple plots in MapleLib, I also just call plot multiple times. I mean, it, I mean, it's partially yeah. that uh, a, probably a sizable chunk of people who now use Python for a lot of their data work probably grew up on MATLAB. Mm. And then when Python became an option, everyone was like, yes, I don't have to use MATLAB anymore, but certain habits are sort of ingrained. Mm. Uh, I also think that particular example, though, those two are very closely like linked I conceptually. The, the, the difference between a scatter plot and a line plot is, is almost sort of trivial, right? It's a question of do you mark the point and do you yeah. connect the points? In Python, you can make a scatter plot using the plot command. You just take line style equals none, and that's it. Um, but no, the other reasons to the multiple line and multiple line is because for a lot of people conceptually, they're kind of plotting all their data together, right? And it's all against the same X. So they don't want to have to like just keep, I know it's like, yes, that's one line of code is always better than 10, even if that one line is a mess. Which I mean is sort of like, that's the trade-off you're seeing with like some of these like Vincent and, you know, has like multiple lines to do something that's really clean versus MPLD3 is kind of just going to take one thing and shove it off. So you're seeing that trade-off and control based on that. It's kind of, kind of interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to make a comment. Yeah. Whereas Matplotlib, everyone's just kind of making a guess that it originated from MATLAB. However, if you look at ggplot and popular yeah. extensions out of Matplotlib, those are actually R. Yeah. So R, you know, R has a lot of very strong plotting capabilities. 
that's kind of always come like the R and G plus stuff is originating out of grammar of graphics, right? Like originally, yeah, so that that the was the sort of like theory of that. Yeah, and the funny. problem is the Matplotlib, like there was no, there was like we're scientists and we used to make figures, right? So the, the, like there was none of this like high level theory stuff. And you actually see it in the refinements of the library. Like it seems like with every new version of the library, they're slowly kind of converging towards like a sensible architecture. But the, the thing in ggplot is that yeah. those all, like each one of those, they're all primitives. Yeah. You do exactly one thing and you have yeah. like one function that deals with handling all the primitives. Yeah. And it's like, you can make incredibly complicated plots in one line and everything's just plus, plus, yeah. plus, plus, plus. Whereas map, map.lib is like plot, star args, keyword args. And yeah. it's like, you do documentation on it and you're just like, Okay, well now I have to go like this huge list of parameters. It's repeated everywhere in the document, so. Yeah, no, I. Yeah, I think it's, it's partially mm. there's sort of a difference mm. in philosophy, mm. right? This is a computer part of oh. graphics approach is, this. I, I, I want to tell a computer what I want to see, right? And then it kind of handles yep. figuring out how to show it to me. Yeah. Whereas the, the map thing is, I want to tell it exactly what to do, right? And if you're, if you're creating a figure that goes in nature, you probably want to spend a week telling it exactly what to do and adjusting the ticks and so on and so forth. Whereas if you just quickly want to see scatter plot, you don't want to do all that. Mm -hmm. So it sort of serves it's two different use cases. Uh, yeah. yeah. I would say that I, the allows you to do that as well. But. Yeah, but I feel like this is the, my favorite quote on Matplotlib, which is like, the easy, th right, the easy things we're going to make easy, the hard things we're going to make API soup, and Seaborn, and Seaborn, by the way, is going to do the same thing, right? It's kind of like that whole, right, like ggplot type thing. We're going to make matplotlib easier for the things I like and things I want to do and I think should be easier. And again, if you want to do anything else, we're going to make, you're going to have to just jump back in. Do you but, know how active the development is I don't know. I mean, I think the problem with Seaborn is that it's like, again, one person at Stanford type deal. <laughs> Yeah, I'm always a little bit worried though with any of the libraries, right, that aren't like taken over by corporate overloads. <laughs> yeah. Good comment. Yeah. Uh, to actually, uh, I've had some good success with NVD3, which is a, allows you to, it's, it's kind of a wrapper on top of D3. So if you're, you can, basically gives you templates for plots, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. And then, if you like ggplot, check out Gadfly, which is Julia's ggplot clone that uh, seems like it's actually <laughs> outpaced ggplot. Uh, well, I don't know if my internet's gonna like all these things. Yeah, I mean, there was, yeah, there was, there's actually, and I didn't even go into when, if you also like need to do networks and stuff, like plotting networks, you really need to be using network X. But network X has the added kind of pain of that it's the graph graphing toolkit, graph toolkit, but it's also, like it does the visualization and the analysis. And like, you've seen Matplotlib is starting to move away from that. And like, because I find anytime they try to start mixing it, it gets really hard to like figure out what's going on. That's the yeah. general question, I guess. Yeah. Sure. Um, plotting is good, but oftentimes we have to draft a report. Yeah. So usually you end up generating HTML embedded with PNG images, yeah. or you generate PDFs with different kinds of combinations of tables and pictures. And so what's the recommended system for Python? You're the second person to ask me this. Because yeah. I gave a Matplotlib tutorial, and a guy was like, how do I make tables in Matplotlib? <laughs> Really, so Python has templates, right? Yeah. Just make an HTML template, fill in the template with your figures, and the thing will spit out clean. So, I have, yeah. I have a uh, quasi answer to that. Yeah. Uh, not to you, but yeah. to your question. There's a tool that recently came out called Dexy. Dexy? Yeah, D-E-X-Y. And it's by this woman named Anna Nelson. And she, I don't know what she works, but it's a, it's sort of doing what it's exactly what you're talking about. Like mm -hmm. basically, it, you set up a template and it sort of runs all of the code and like report generation code mm -hmm. you have, and you can like plug in shell scripts and it'll call it in Python. And, uh, 
Are you guys use knitter? Like with R? Yeah, knitter R. Yeah. 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 I think you can do knitter with Python too. Well, recently I've been using Pendog. It's all Haskell. Yeah. But it's and huge, it's, it's right? got yeah, it's it's got tight integration with my Python, but then it's huge time. I'm I'm kind of wondering if you can almost like use Sphinx to do the same kind of thing. Sphinx. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, actually, uh, one point, because I didn't have access to the handoff and box in question, and I had a bunch of notes to, to convert to something. The notebook yeah. format itself is actually really, really straightforward. If you just want to, if you have a like, specific simple use case and a specific simple report you want to build, it's very straightforward to just yeah. pull up the cells of a certain type. Format them the way you want. Yeah. Write them the way you want. Uh, I think that what makes what makes the whole Pandoc and then associated templating thing somewhat complicated is that it tries to do so many things. Right? Pandoc sort of tries to convert everything to everything with anything in between, which is a much larger problem than I have this one notebook with a very specific layout and I just want this one thing to come out looking at. Uh, and sort of random plug, if you ever have lots of time to kill, uh, Matplotlib has a Tix backend, which is uh, when you can save the Tix, and Tix is basically a drawing library for tech. So instead of putting PNGs in your LaTeX documents, you can actually put like explicit drawing commands in the LaTeX documents, and it comes out looking much much nicer. But this is something you do if you're like grad school writing pieces and you have time to fit, right? So it's, and it's sort of a fun thing to play with, but I can't say I would sanely recommend it to anyone who's not dead. Yeah, I mean, if you're only doing figures and you can just use some app with PDF backend, for like, it's only for figures and like, like, like you said, you need to do something that actually, if you have text, you need to like inject into your figures somehow. And it's 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 kind of kludgy of the PDF backend, anyways. It's, it, there's there's bugs to it, like especially if you have like legends on backlist and stuff, it'll just like run your shit like off the page. Oh, that's, that, that could be your next talk. How do you actually trap the nice looking report and automate the whole thing? You begged somebody to like sponsor Google some of code for someone to make it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for all the input. <laughs> questions? Any other questions? Comments? Yeah. Oops. So that was 20 minutes? <laughs> yeah, no, I kind of knew that was good. Yeah, the person also finished, yeah, so Thank you. Okay. Thank you.